Thank you so much, Carrie. And also, thanks to Christy, who is captioning uh, today's webinar for us. Such an intense job. So thank you, Christy. We really appreciate it. So I also want to welcome all of you today um, to today's webinar, and thank you for joining us. So this is the first in a three-part series um, that we're doing about when victims of battering are charged with crimes. And if you haven't yet signed up for parts two and three and are interested in doing that, you can go to the web links that Carrie just mentioned to do that. Either you'll get to the um, National Clearinghouse website or the Battered Women's Justice website. You can sign up on either. And Dot, who is working with us today, Dot Goldberger, thank you. She, I think, just posted those two links, or will. So before I go further, I want to thank the FIPSA office. That's the Family Violence Prevention and Services Program at the US Department of Health and Human Services um, for their support of this webinar series, but also really for their long-term support of so much of our work here at the National Clearinghouse on behalf of victims of battering charged with crimes over the years. I realize Carrie did uh, introduce me as Sue O. That's what I go by, but my na full name is Sue Ostoff. Um, and I am the director here at the National Clearinghouse for the Defense of Battered Women, which is in Philadelphia. Uh, so just remember that we are collecting questions in the chat box that Carrie talked about. And we plan to leave about 15 minutes at the end uh, for questions. Since I will be collecting them myself, I will acknowledge that I see your question. And then I will ask Cindine as many of your questions as I can at the end. So our presenter today, uh, I know that a number of you know her. She's our legal coordinator here at the National Clearinghouse. And her name is Cindine Fazell. And it's really my pleasure to introduce her. Um, we've been fortunate enough here at the National Clearinghouse to know Cindine for a really long time. She was actually an intern with us during her law school years. And then she became a public defender here in Philadelphia, where she represented indigent people facing felony and misdemeanor charges. And then during her final year as a public defender, Cindine had a really rather unique gig. She practiced exclusively in family court, providing criminal defense to people accused of crimes involving the violation of a civil protection order. So it, brought, it gave her a whole unique set of skills to come back to the National Clearinghouse when she rejoined us in 2008 as our legal coordinator. And in addition to coordinating our legal team, Cindine provides direct technical assistance to defense teams. She researches and develops legal materials and conducts training programs, as well as works on a number of special projects. Um, we're delighted that Cindine has agreed to conduct this series. And today, as you can see there, we're starting with background and overview. And before I hand this over to Cindine, just a reminder about typing the questions in the chat box. Um, and we'll get to as many as we can. And remember, there's two more webinars coming up. So if we don't get to all the questions on this webinar, hopefully we can address them in the next two. So Cindine, thanks so much for all your great work. And it's just such a pleasure to get to work with you. And thanks for your willingness to share it with us today. So without further ado, I'm going to turn over the virtual mic to you. Thank you very much, Sue O, oh, for saying so many nice things about me. Um, it is my great pleasure to be here. And I am thrilled to see so many names from people across the country and beyond. Um, as Sue mentioned, I have worked with many of you, and I've known many of you. And so that being said, for many of you, this will be um, somewhat of a review to the things you already know. Um, as Sue also mentioned, we're doing this in a three-part series. Um, and I'm. I'm, I'm glad to be doing it that way, because we're going to get to spend a little bit more time on everything. Um, and so today really is going to be about background information um, and an overview about working with victim defendants. Many of you are going to be um, looking for some of the nuts and bolts, the concrete advocacy stuff. We're absolutely going to be talking about that. And we hope that each and every one of you um, tunes in for the rest of the webinar series as well as today. And if you can't do that, um, then to at least the recordings are going to be made available to you. So welcome. And as Sue said, please put all your questions in the chat box. We'll get to as many as we can. 
you know, I'm interested in talking about what you want to talk about, not just what I want to talk about. So I really do welcome questions. So in case you're not familiar with the work of the National Clearinghouse for the Defense of Battered Women, um, we work with a um, section of the victim population, and that section is those who have um, involvement as a defendant in the criminal legal system. So victims who have been charged with crimes. When we do our direct technical assistance with attorneys and expert witnesses and advocates, um, we're working on the cases where somebody's experiences of abuse have a, some kind of legal relationship to the crimes that they're charged with. So if their experiences of abuse are going to be raised during the trial to support the defense in any way, that's kind of where that piece of our expertise comes in. Um, we also, you know, as is obvious from this webinar, we conduct training programs, too, to talk with people about advocating effectively um, for victims of battering who have been charged with crimes um, and working with people in jails and prisons. We will work on a survivor's case at any stage, including pre-arrest, um, all the way to clemency. So it doesn't have to be just at the trial stage for us to be involved. Um, and that also goes for people who might be in fear of being arrested, OK? So like I said, I know we've worked with many of you, and we hope that we'll work with many more of you after, after this webinar as we talk about the resources that we can actually offer to you. So today, we're going to spend time um, talking about how victims of battering end up in the legal system in the first place as defendants, OK? I know. You know, for a lot of people, particularly advocates, they might have a great deal of experience um, on what a victim's, ex you know, on what a victim's exposure to the criminal legal system looks like from the perspective of a complaining witness, but not necessarily from the perspective of the, of, of the defense. So we're going to be talking about that. Um, we're going to be talking about some of the challenges that victim defendants face. Uh, as a result of being defendants in the system. Um, and here's where we're just going to chat for a little while about collateral consequences. But we're really going to be focused on the things that have unique impacts on people who are defendants and also survivors. We're also going to be going over some of the difficulties that victim defendants experience at times when they're seeking services. Um, related to the, for their battering. And we're going to be talking about safety risks um, that can come up when somebody is involved in the criminal legal system who is also a survivor. But I want to start by throwing up a few lists of adjectives. Um, and I think these adjectives are going to look really familiar to a lot of us um, who have worked with victims in any capacity. OK, we, we know that there's, as soon as somebody talks about their experiences of having survived abuse, their credibility is almost always immediately called into question. And I'm not just talking about you know, when people are in court. I'm talking about in general. Um, I'm sure we know this from our work. We also know this from, from the media, right? You know, as soon as you know, somebody, whether it's through the Me Too movement or in some other way, Somebody shares what happened, happened to them, and so many people come out of the woodwork to doubt those particular claims. Okay? The credibility is always a barrier for victims. You know, There's this perception that there must be some reason why people would want to lie about their experiences of abuse. You know, Maybe they're crazy. We hear that word a lot, unfortunately. Um, maybe they're trying to get something, or they're attention-seeking, they're looking for money. I'm sure there's a million other things that people say when somebody shares that they have been abused. Um, you know, we're here, we're in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, which is one county over from where the trial was held, um, Bill, Bill Cosby, excuse me, Bill Cosby's trial was held. And, you know, there was obviously a lot of people coming out of the woodwork to talk about how all these women who had accused them were just doing it to get attention. And the best response I heard to that was somebody who, who had asked 
um, you know, ask one of those people who made that accusation to name five of his accusers. And of course, they couldn't do it because it was not a very effective strategy for getting that kind of attention. So anyway, we, we know that credibility is a huge problem, even for just mentioning that somebody has experiences of abuse. Now take that same situation and put it in court, and now we have another layer of reasons why people are disbelieved for talking about their abuse. You know, are they just making excuses for bad behavior? Are they just an out-and-out -out liar? Um, are they trying to get over on the system? You know, perhaps they're taking things out of proportion. Maybe we don't care if she's lying or not, um, but we're going to use what she says about being abused against her in terms of making custody decisions, because she must be a bad mom if she lets that kind of thing happen. So, you know, not only now are we dealing with credibility attacks, we're dealing with character attacks too, and all that's happened is that people have talked about their experiences of abuse. This is nothing new to any of you. We all know this. This is a, a, a credibility question that all victims carry. Now, let's talk about defendants for a minute, and I'm not even necessarily talking about victim defendants yet. But defendants, and by defendants I'm talking about anybody who's been charged, although not necessarily convicted of a crime, they have similar um, questions that get raised about their character and about their credibility. There are labels that attach to people once arrested that kind of stick with them, you know, throughout the criminal legal process and beyond. Again, this is regardless of whether people end up getting convicted. Um, some of the adjectives on this particular slide are, you know, suspect, that's a word that, that we use a lot, uh, perpetrator, victimizer, criminal, batterer. You know, all these things are, are going to affect the lens that defendants are, are judged by, you know, whether or not they are ultimately convicted of a crime. Another thing we hear all the time is if somebody gets arrested, even if they didn't do it, what they're accused of, they must have done something because they got arrested. There's this mythology that, you know, there's always, a, you know, that something must have happened if an arrest took place. Um, and we know for a lot of reasons that that's not necessarily true. Um, so take those adjectives that attach to victims, take that other list of adjectives that gets applied to defendants, put them together, um, and imagine the barriers based on stereotypes alone and misperceptions alone that victim defendants face once they're involved in the criminal legal system. You know, first of all, we have the, the problem that the minute somebody gets arrested, it feels like whatever, the, whatever they have gone through in their life gets thrown out the window because now they go in the bad guy box instead of the good guy box, right? So they're not a, quote, real victim. Um, then there's the idea that whatever somebody says about their background is being used in order to cut, try to game the system. Um, we've heard the phrase abuse excuse thrown around for the past 30 years, saying that people who raise their experiences of abuse in court, particularly as defendants, um, are trying to quote unquote get off because they have had a bad life. You know, that's what we hear. Um, and it, you know, those are just, so, so it's challenges layered upon challenges, and it all comes together uh, into what I sometimes call the victim-defendant tax. Um, and, and basically what I mean by that tax is all of the myths and misconceptions and, and stereotypes that come together to create a situation where a victim's experiences of abuse end up getting used against her in court, whether consciously or unconsciously, um, because they're used to undermine credibility, they're used to impart particular motives. They're all the ways in which victim defendants sometimes don't have as fair a shake in court um, as other defendants might, okay? And, and I bring this up because, you know, the National Clearinghouse has been doing this work 
with victim defendants for a long period of time. And it's never been about trying to get special rules for victim defendants. It's about trying to make sure that victim defendants, when they're going through, um, through their trial process, have the same access to due process that all defendants are entitled to. And that are, so in other words, that they're not burdened because their experiences of abuse happen to play a role uh, in their legal case. Most of us have worked directly with victims, and so we know what some of the more common trauma symptoms look like. Um, we, we also know that victims engage in a number of strategies sometimes to cope with the abuse that they're going through. Um, and it just so happens, <laughs> I know that some of you can't see the slide, but for those of you that can, the things that we see that are extraordinarily common for victims to do can mimic some of the reasons that people don't end up being believed. Um, so when you're talking to somebody and you feel like they're not keeping their story straight or that they're making it up as they go along, you might make some judgments about whether or not they're telling you the truth um, in that particular moment. But we also know that people who are victims can sometimes not communicate in a linear fashion, particularly about the things, um, about the traumatic experiences. We also know that trauma victims can sometimes recall better a traumatic incident if some time goes by. Um, well, sometimes when people keep on adding to their story, they get accused of making it up as they go along. Um, Another thing that, that we hang our hats on in terms of being able to tell whether somebody's lying is by the emotional response or lack thereof that they're having. Uh, and we know that trauma victims often have emotional responses that might seem puzzling from the outside looking in. Um, and then there's this idea out there in the world that anybody who has gone through something as terrible as being battered by their partner um, that there would be a trace of that somewhere in the world. Well, and if there's not, then they must be lying about it. And so, all you know, all I'm trying to illustrate is that the realities about somebody's experiences of trauma can often look like the very things that indicate um, a lack of credibility. And so, understanding that is what we what we have to do when we are assisting victims who are charged with crimes, because that's the barrier that they're going to have to overcome if they're going to be believed, if they're going to have access to due process, and if they're going to have any hope to get um, a just and fair outcome for the reason that they're there in court. So those first few minutes we were talking about, you know, some of these built-in kind of baked-in things that people who are victimized and people who are defendants can face. Now take that and imagine all of that at the intersection of other oppressions, okay? So think about the ways that those particular challenges can um, come together for somebody who is disabled, for example. You know, what kind of barriers are they going to face once they're in the criminal legal system? Or if somebody's a non-English speaker, so you know, already they're battered, already they're viewed with an air of suspicion, and now um, they can't even communicate in their first language to explain their side of the story. Uh, we know that people of color are overrepresented in the criminal legal system. And so when, you know, racism um, intersects with being a defendant, when it intersects with, with being a victim, you know, we're, we're having this person who is facing disbelief from all sides. Um, you know, I think we, you know, there's been a lot of conversations, um, and there should be many more, uh, going on about how uh, people of color are launched into the criminal legal system as defendants in a, you know, in a way that's disproportionate to most other people, right? But I also want to make sure that we're thinking about racism when we're looking at the way that that person not just gets into the system, but moves through the system, okay? Because how somebody is treated and perceived and believed once they're in the system 
um, is equally as important, and racism can play a huge factor. Um, I remember that when I was a public defender, if I had a client who you know, was an indignant white guy, he was indignant because he wanted justice for his case. Okay, if I had a client who was an indignant uh, black woman, you know, then she was the tip, you know, she was the angry black woman, then that she was being loud and that she should shut up. I mean, that was just, you know, that was the reality of the, you know, the same behavior but the different perceptions um, and the challenges that were faced uh, by people who have to experience racism when they're also defendants. So, so that's, so, so we, we can't just focus on how people get in the system, how they're treated in the system, then of course what the outcomes in the system are. You know, who's, who's, who ends up getting convicted and who doesn't, who gets special deals and who doesn't, um, who gets proportionate sentencing and who doesn't. We, ha we have to make sure that we're not, um, you know, we're not looking at these things in a vacuum and we have to keep the realities of all the ways in which people are oppressed at the front of our minds when we're working with them as uh, battered defendants. So a few times today, I think you've heard, you've heard me say victim a bunch. Um, I'm, but I also I just wanted to be clear that when I'm talking about victims in the context that we're discussing this today, I am really focused on um, anybody who's a victim and not somebody who is a uh, complaining witness, okay? If I mean complaining witness, that's what I'm going to say, and a complaining witness is a person um, against whom a crime was allegedly committed. The reason, I know a lot of people don't like that language, and I understand why, but when I, I, I just, you know, we at the Clearinghouse want to emphasize that being a victim has no bearing on what side of the courtroom you're sitting on. You might be sitting on the prosecution side, you might be sitting on the defense side, um, but whether or not you're arrested, whether or not you're convicted, none of those things are determinative of whether or not you're somebody who has experienced an in intimate partner battering. So I talked about how the, you know, the clearinghouse does not advocate for special rules for uh, victims who have been charged with crimes. But what we are looking for are fair trials and just outcomes for battered defendants, but for all defendants as well. And what we mean by that is that somebody's access to access to justice in court should not be tainted by their experiences of abuse. They should not be tainted by racism. They should not be tainted um, by heterosexism or other forms of oppression, that all defendants are entitled to that kind of justice unburdened by those oppressions. We're saying that context really matters, that somebody actually cannot get full access to justice if the context of their life isn't understood, or at the very least, the context of the incident for which they are in court. Um, you know, no, nothing happens in a vacuum, and a proper outcome is an outcome that is going to be determined by consideration of all of the relevant context. We're also saying that somebody's criminal record doesn't make them unbattered. Regardless of whether somebody has had criminal legal system involvement, that all survivors are entitled to and are deserving of our advocacy and support. I know that feels really complicated sometimes when people get charged with really scary and dangerous things, but being charged with those things doesn't lessen the fact that they are uh, victims and survivors of trauma and abuse. So there are many ways that victims can end up defendants in the criminal legal system. Um, and we want to emphasize, you know, we'll talk about some specific charges people face, but we want to be clear that although the National Clearinghouse legal team works on cases with this legal relationship between somebody's experiences of abuse um, and the crimes for which they're charged, you know, that's definitely not the only way it happens. In other words, um, 
you know, we hear a lot, I think, about, you know, victims who might act in self-defense against their abusive partner. You know, that's definitely one thing that we see in terms of, of charged and incarcerated survivors, but there's not necessarily always going to be that direct nexus, and I'll give some more examples of a direct nexus in a minute. Um, I think it's probably much more common uh, in the world to see indirect relationships between what somebody's charged with and the abuse that they've endured. You know, and by indirect relationship, I guess uh, what I'm saying is perhaps those charges would not have occurred but for somebody's experiences of abuse, but there's not going to be a role to talk about those experiences of abuse in the defense of the legal case, okay? So, you know, this is where whatever somebody is accused of doing, um, the, the, you know, there's no legal defense that encompasses the abuse that they endured in, in a way that's going to be helpful in court. Um, sometimes people can bring up abuse at their sentencing or as mitigation or, or to, you know, to, to ex illustrate for a sentencing judge what they were going through at the time they were accused, perhaps of an economic crime, um, but it's not going to be something that rises to the level of a full defense like self-defense. I suppose there are some cases where a defendant's experiences of abuse might have nothing at all to do with why they're charged. But it's hard to think of examples, to be honest. The, the only real category that I can come up with are um, factually innocent defendants. You know, the, the bad lineup that gets the wrong person, like that kind of thing. But I think for the most part, it's fair to say that, you know, if somebody has trauma and abuse in their life and they're also charged with a crime, you know, you're going you're gonna to find some way in which that's connected. Again, whether you do or whether you don't is not relevant to some, whether somebody deserves advocacy and services, um, but that relationship is going to um, have some impact on the scope of work that will have to be done on behalf of that battered defendant. So when we're talking about um, criminal charges that are legally and directly related to a defendant's experiences of abuse, we're really talking about, um, as I said before, when those experiences of abuse can excuse the crime for which they're charged. Self-defense is definitely the most common example of that. You know, we see assault cases where um, victims have defended themselves. We see hom homicide cases where victims have defended themselves. Or we see homicide cases where victims have defended their children um, from their abusive partner. So in order for a judge or a jury to understand why the defendant was in fear in the moment of the incident and why that fear was reasonable, that judge or jury has to hear about the victim's experiences of abuse. Okay, So that's a direct legal relationship. Duress cases are another wide category of cases we see where there's a direct relationship between somebody's experiences of abuse and the crimes for which they're charged. And these cases are the ones in which somebody participates in criminalized activity uh, based on you know, fear of immediate death or serious bodily injury at the hands of their abusive partner. So these cases can be anything. You know, we've, we've worked on homicide cases that involve duress. Sometimes it's economic crimes, um, all the way, <laughs> you know, all the way from bank robbery to bad check writing. You know, it's it's where the person who's charged with the crime chooses the criminal activity over harm to themselves. Duress is one of those areas that I think advocates. Um, understand implicitly better than um, better than many of the attorneys that I've I've worked with because they see what duress can look like every single day. Um, the criminal legal system has a hard time grappling with duress because, especially when it comes to victim defendants, and I think there's a lot of reasons for that. Is but one is that it's not so easy 
to convince a fact finder, a judge or jury, that there was no way to get out of the dangerous situation besides participating in the crime. You know, from the outside looking in, there always seems to be a moment or a phone call that can be made or an option. You know, if, if the person forcing the victim to commit the crime didn't have a literal gun to the head, you know, it's, it's pretty hard to show. Um, but advocates see victims coerced into doing things every single day. And they understand that though that gun to the head may be invisible, it's definitely um, still there. So the, you know, we're going to talk a lot more about ways that advocates and defense attorneys can work together. But I think, I think attorneys will have a lot to learn from advocates, especially when it comes to understanding you know, how how fear works in the life of a victim of battering who has not done what he or she has been told and has had to face those consequences. So those are um, duress cases. Um, another thing I'll say about duress cases is that, you know, it's, it's not very often a successful defense. Um, and even in cases where it looks like it can be viable, there's a whole category of defendants that are not prohibited to present a duress defense because in many states there's an exception to the duress defense for people who allegedly knew or should have known that they were putting themselves in a situation under which they would be likely to be placed under duress. I know that's a mouthful, <laughs> um, but I, what, you know, really what that exception goes to are you know, legislators trying to figure out how to prevent gang members from asserting that the things that they did while in that gang should be excused because they were done under duress. You know, the idea is that if you joined the gang, you knew that that gang was going to be making you do things you didn't want to do. I think that's the basic idea behind that exception. However, we've seen it get applied to battered women defendants um, many, many times. So, um, you know, when prosecutors or courts say that victims of battering who choose to be with a dangerous partner are putting themselves in the situation, um, they're essentially equating um, a battering relationship with organized crime. Um, and they're blaming, you know, the, it's the whole victim blaming paradigm, you know, decide, telling the person that, you know, choosing, quote unquote, choosing this abusive relationship um, means that you do not get the benefit of the duress defense anymore. Um, and it's a false equivalency, but it's, it's been successfully used against better defendants um, at least several times that I know of. We see cases where victims get charged with crimes that have been completely fabricated by their abusive partner. Now there's no, you know, the defense to this one is just, I didn't do it. <laughs> you know, it's, it's not a self-defense, it's not a duress, it's a, it didn't happen, or if it did happen, I'm not the one who did it. Um, people, you know, I think sometimes people have a hard time believing that, you know, abusers would go that far, but, but advocates don't have any trouble believing that because they see it all the time. We, we know that sometimes abusive partners to their own detriment will say things about the people they are victimizing in order to get them into trouble. Um, when I was a public defender, I represented this woman whose boyfriend actually punched himself in the face and then blamed it on her. Uh, he, had a, he certainly had a black eye. I was, I, that was my first and only he punched his own self-defense. And, it, you know, I did end up losing that trial, surprise, surprise. But um, afterward, at the sentencing, the complainant's father admitted to me that his son punched himself in the face. So that's how I know that it happened. So these situations are, are complex because you're, you know, defendants are in the position of not explaining why they did what they did, but having to convince a fact finder that it just didn't happen. Um, 
and it's one of the it's, an, it's another one of those dual realities we live in where we know if somebody comes to the criminal legal system saying that they have been you know sexually victimized they are going to be met with suspicion they're going to be met with some questions about whether or not that actually happened right on the other hand if somebody you know, if uh, abusive partners are really good at convincing the system that things happen that didn't happen, okay? So this, this, this credibility deficit that survivors go through can impact them in several ways, no matter whether they're involved in the criminal legal system on the defense or as a complainant. Parental kidnapping cases are another thing that we see. And these cases come up when survivors take their children and flee an abusive situation in order to protect themselves and or their children. Some of you may have never seen a parental kidnapping case in the communities in which you work, and some of you may have seen many. Um, these kinds of charges do tend to cluster in different communities, you know, just kind of depending on the policies and the agendas of, of law enforcement and prosecution in any one given community. Um, there's a lot of misinformation out there in the world about parental kidnapping situations, and that can cause big problems for, for, for victim defendants. One of those mythologies is that if there is no custody order, either parent can do whatever they want. That might be true in some places, uh, but it's certainly not true in all places. What we've seen time and time and time and time again is that a battered mom gets advised, you know, by an attorney or by somebody else that since there's no custody order, they're free to take their children or child and go wherever they want. Um, what ends up happening is the abusive partner then goes and gets an ex parte uh, custody order, giving him emergency, you know, full legal custody, and then you know, when she doesn't show up for the court date, as she won't do because she doesn't know about it, then that can trigger a whole bunch of other responses. One is, you know, loss of, you know, continued loss of custody, but one can be a warrant for arrest based on charges of parental kidnapping. Um, this happens, this happens in some communities all the time. On the other side of that coin, are crimes related to failing to protect. And in this particular context, I'm not talking about child protective services cases accusing people of failing to protect their children. I'm talking about criminal charges that somebody can face based on the actions of their abusive partner, usually against their children. So people can be charged with homicide under a failure to protect theory you know, if, if a child dies because, and the court feels that one of the parents didn't do enough to protect that child from the abusive partner, then they can be prosecuted for homicide under that theory. Um, if, you know, and the, you know the, the idea is that there should have been something that that parent could have done to either intervene or to give aid or to protect or to prevent, okay? This is another one that can cluster in certain communities, people getting charged with crimes based on failure to protect. We tend to hear about from particular jurisdictions more than others, but it's, but it's, you know, it's, definitely, it's definitely a phenomenon in a lot of different places. So you, know, you have parental kidnapping where somebody takes action, gets themselves, gets their child as far away as they can from an abusive situation, and then you have failure to protect where somebody, you know, stays in the, stays in the situation and, you know, and doesn't leave and doesn't, quote, unquote, you know, deprive the other parent of access to the child. And either way, there's resulting criminal charges. So battered women, uh, battered defendants are in this catch-22. They have to try to balance, you know, what level of protection is the right amount of protection? Because too much protection, there's going to be arrest. Too little protection, there's going to be an arrest. You know, it's, it's this catch-22 that criminalizes whatever choices a survivor is making 
in order to continue to survive and to protect her children. So those are some categories of maybe the more common cases that we see where there's a direct relationship between abuse and between the charges. Um, I would say that drug cases, driving under the influence cases, and economic crimes are what we tend to see when we know that people's, uh, you know, people's lives have been impacted by abuse and they have to make choices to survive, and those choices happen to be criminalized. So for the economic crimes, it could be because people need to steal to eat. It could be because people are writing bad checks because there's no other way to get income, or maybe you know their abusive partner is really financially controlling. Um, drug cases we see play out in many different ways. Do people self-medicate? Sure. But we also see cases where um, people get arrested for their abusive partner's drugs, <laughs> you know, being, you know, living in drug houses and that kind of thing. And then we, you know, DUI cases are, are fairly common. There have been a couple successful um, d defense arguments that somebody had to drive drunk because they were fleeing an abusive situation, but that's not one that usually flies, unfortunately. So if somebody has to make choices in order to survive, but there's no, you know, that, that's, I think that's where we're going to see the majority um, of victim defendants. And that being said, you know, if we want to step back for a minute and, and not just think about ways that uh, victim defendants, that, you know, survivors of battering get involved in the system as defendants, but the way that anybody gets involved in the system as a defendant, we know that the vast majority of people who have spent any time in jails or prisons have experienced trauma at some point in their lives, whether as children or as an adult, and regardless of gender. So although we're focusing on intimate partner violence here today, it's certainly true that uh, you know so many drug crimes and economic crimes, you know, what lies under those are not people just trying to get high and rich, they're people who are doing what they have to do to survive. Um, I have some a couple slides here from the sentencing project and the link to their website and a fuller report on this is located in the web links pod uh, to the right of the chart. But I wanted to highlight just a couple things that they've put together about women's incarceration because then I, wanna, I want that to be the backdrop to what I'm going to say about um, survivors' incarceration. Um, we know that the rate of women in prison has risen at twice the rate um, of men. And there's a, there's a lot of reasons for that, but one of those reasons is not because women have gotten inherently more violent over time. These rise in incarceration is not because um, of violent crime, but because of drug crimes, because of economic crimes. Between 1980 and 2016, there was a 700% increase and the number of women who were jailed or incarcerated here in the United States, okay? A 700% increase. Um, some states, unfortunately, you know, kind of stand out as incarcerators of, of women. I've, I've done some training uh, down in Oklahoma. The advocates down there are mobilized and on top of this issue, but they know that their state is responsible for putting lots of girls and lots of women in jails and prisons, and particularly mothers. Um, so a shout out right now to all the people in Oklahoma who are just doing amazing work trying to rectify that. Um, so we have this huge increase of people. We know that it's, you know, we know that the war on drugs contributed a great deal to this increase. Um, stiffer penalties, mandatory minimums, sentencing schemes that keep people in for a long period of time. Um, these are the reasons why we're seeing more and more and more women um, getting incarcerated. There have been some drops off recently, and that's fantastic. In fact, uh, you know, the, the number of, I, I talked earlier about how um, African American women are disproportionately incarcerated. Uh, that number is luckily going down. Um, 
it's still not proportionate, but the but it's that but it's decreasing. So there are things that are happening that are our strides being made, um, but there are still a ghastly number of people, including women and girls, incarcerated in this country. So that being said, we know that prisoners must, you know, prisoners and defendants and formerly incarcerated people have an extreme need for advocacy. There have been studies that have been done to try to measure um, who among our incarcerated population are, are, are victims of abuse, either as adults or as children or both. And you know what, what we've been seeing is some, some pretty high numbers when you have a large governmental study, um, you know, done by the Bureau of Prisons or, or, or whomever, we're seeing numbers around 50%. In other words, 50% of um, incarcerated women are reporting some experiences of abuse. But when the researchers aren't necessarily the government, when the researchers are people who know how to do more varied and in-depth surveys and talk to people in a way that gets better answers, <laughs> quite frankly, about their experiences of abuse, we see that the numbers actually go much higher. Um, the highest percentage of people, of incarcerated women reporting abuse that we've seen has been 95%, but the numbers tend to be at least 70 to 90%. So. We know that we know two things. We know that there's so many girls and women in prison, and we know that so many of those girls and women in prison are victims. And we know that these girls and women in prison who are victims are in need of advocacy and in need of support. Sometimes it's not so easy to look at what somebody is accused of doing and to look at their experiences of abuse and connect the dots together. Um, you know, we might be, we might see somebody with some horrendous accusations against him or her or some bizarre accusations. Um, we might see accusations that look a lot like, um, you know, victimizing of other people. However, we don't have to be able to connect those dots in order to know that somebody who is a survivor is deserving of and entitled to our support and our services. And I know that that's easier said than done. I know that situations can get complicated, particularly if people are accused of crimes um, that make us very uncomfortable, such as crimes against children, but being arrested and having a record, you know, doesn't mean that somebody is no longer a victim. So I don't think we need to spend an enormous amount of time talking about all the bad things that can happen to people because they end up arrested or with a criminal record. That's definitely, I think, a narrative that we're all pretty familiar with. But I do want to talk about it a little bit because it bears pointing out ways that victims are uniquely impacted, and it bears pointing out how some of those impacts might be disproportionately bad for victims than they would be for non-victims. So these collateral consequences, um, you know, the, I think I think that the biggest consequence that people think about or talk about is impact on employment. How many doors are closed to you? if you have a criminal record. There's quite a few doors that end up being closed to you in a variety of professions. Um, housing and housing assistance is impacted by criminal records. You know, public benefits. Um, I know that some of these depend on what the charges are, but the presence of a record is definitely going to um, mean that some people become ineligible for assistance that they could get before. There's going to be educational opportunities that are not available to people with 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 an arrest record, um, and you know I'm pointing all these out in a really general way, simply to say that 
you know, being arrested and having a record means that any given person's pool of options for living is decreased. And as options decrease, risk increases. So if a, the, the less choice a survivor has about where he or she can work, you know, the more chance there is that there is going to be some risk. Is she going to have to be um, dependent, you know, on, you know, she can have to remain in a dangerous, dangerous situation because all these doors are closed, doors that had she been able to walk through them could have led to self-sufficiency, like employment, like housing, like education. So as options decrease, risk for survivors increases. Um, money stuff, you know, is perhaps the most concrete thing to think about because, you know, if, if somebody can't have access to financial resources, you know, survivors have enough trouble with that anyway, but if there are actual in place concrete legal barriers to employment, legal barriers to housing, legal barriers to um, benefits, um, you know, welfare, welfare benefits and that kind of thing too, where are the survivors going to have to turn in order to make it to the next day? You know, is their abusive partner going to be the only resource who is left? So having a record can mean for a lot of people who may have otherwise been able to, to separate from their abusive partner that they cannot anymore because those options have been removed for them. The impact on child custody, I don't think, can be overstated. You know, even in situations where, you know, criminal record, may, maybe it's, you know, in certain situations, maybe the court is or is not allowed to consider it. But the, the presence of an arrest, even without a conviction, is going to get raised by an abusive partner. And as soon as somebody has an arrest record, you know, it might be invisible. You know, maybe their job isn't impacted. Um, but, you know, what is impacted is their credibility. Because even though a case might go away, even though an acquittal might happen, once somebody gets arrested, you know, that's going to be, le you know, leveraged against them in court, particularly if the charge has something to do with their abusive partner. If the arrest turns into a conviction, you know, this whole thing can skyrocket. Um, there's definitely states where, you know, say, say, say a survivor gets convicted of simple assault because of a situation that she had with her abusive partner. She might not have the option to opt out of mediation that she once had, um, you know, as, as, a, as a survivor of domestic violence. She's no longer considered a survivor now that she has this conviction for simple assault. Um, Parental, parental rights can be on the line for a lot of victims of battering, particularly if there's extended incarceration. If a survivor has been isolated and they don't any, you know, they no longer have the kind of family and community resources that maybe they once did, there might not be as many options for their children should they become incarcerated, which could mean foster care, which could mean termination. Um, you know, or it could be a situation where, you know, the, the abusive partner is now the only available caretaker. And so not, is he, not only is he or she caretaker, they're also gatekeeper. Um, so child custody is, you know, it's not necessarily directly um, in the economic impact bucket of collateral consequences that we think about, but it's huge. And I think for a lot of the survivors that we talk to, it, it, it's one of the most important um, and most detrimental impacts that arrests and convictions can have for them. Perception in the community, you know, I know I'm a little bit about a broken record with credibility here today, but it's so important and not just about being believed in court. It's important with the way that somebody moves in the world and throughout their community, okay? Um, so, you know, if somebody a survivor gets convicted particularly of a crime um, related to domestic violence, whether it was, you know, assaulting their partner or whatever, 
they're, you know, there's this label that attaches to them in a more profound way even than it had already attached to them before that decides what kind of services they're going to get. Um, so even though somebody may have had a lifetime of abuse, now they're going to batter's intervention. Um, I know that there's many communities that have found, you know, some great alternatives for when that unfortunate circumstance happens, but there are still times when people are absolutely labeled batterers, even though they were the ones who were battered. Um, we've also heard about uh, batter women's service organizations, community-based service organizations who don't assist uh, victims who have been arrested. And that denial of services is based sometimes on the fact that somebody has an open case or on the fact that somebody has a criminal record. Um, I've actually heard people say to me, they're like, I can't go to XYZ program because now I'm the perpetrator. Okay. So it's not just access to money. It's not just access to um, housing and other benefits. You know, it's access to the kind of services that victims need in order to decrease risk and increase safety, if at all possible. Speaking of risk. Um, I think one of the most important consequences of you know, one's involvement as a defendant in the criminal legal system is the increase in risk. When an abusive partner can leverage all of the power of the state against the person that they're victimizing, that's an enormous advantage for him or for her. How does this play out? Well. If an abusive partner is the one that was supposedly um, the victim of a crime, you know they're going to be in a particularly good place to exercise a lot of leverage. In fact, we, you know, we heard a case of, we heard about a case like this just today, where um, an abusive partner was was coercing his victim to do certain things by either, you know, promising not to show up in court or threatening to call. Um, the pretrial services and get and get the victim rearrested again. So this whole period of time where somebody's out on bail, if the abusive partner is the complainant, you know they can make one phone call and make sure that an arrest happens again. They can also do things to undermine whatever those release conditions are. We've seen this numerous times too. If a if an abusive partner forces their victim to drink and then calls a probation officer or a pretrial officer you know, boom, that person's in violation of their release conditions. This is just an enormous amount of power that a batterer can wield in certain situations. Let's also talk about help-seeking behavior. You know, we hear all the time about, you know, why didn't so-and-so call the cops? Why didn't they reach out to the police? Well, can you imagine what happens when somebody does reach out to the police, but they're the ones who end up getting arrested? They're never going to call the police again, if, even, if, even if they need help. If they call the police again, they may end up in handcuffs again. So help-seeking behavior is dramatically altered, you know, when, when a victim ends up being the one who gets placed in the police car. And then there's the, the, the restriction that can happen on getting away from, from danger. So many people have um, facial restrictions on what they are and are not allowed to do. And that's whether they're out on bail or whether they're on probation or parole or maybe on house arrest, electronic monitoring, that kind of thing. You know, sometimes you physically, literally cannot, you know, escape danger without violating the conditions of your bail or probation. You know, somebody's, you know, imagine the situation where somebody's on house arrest, they're wearing an electronic monitor, that monitor goes off if they leave the house. What do they do if the abusive partner shows up? Um, some people might say call the cops, but I would admit that somebody uh, with an ankle bracelet on is not likely to see the cost as a particularly helpful resource. So the physical ability to get away, the batterers increase leverage, and the opportunities or desires to, to, you know, to ask police for help, these are all things that are seriously diminished once a survivor has been involved as a defendant in the criminal legal system. Okay, I'm going to take a breath <laughs> and talk about some barriers that we know 
that um, a lot of uh, people have experienced when, when attempting to work with uh, victims who have been charged with crimes. Um, we're not going to talk a whole lot about overcoming these barriers today, but we are definitely having that conversation, and that's going to happen on the July 11th webinar. So I really hope you're there for that. But right now, we want to focus on what gets in the way, because we can't start eliminating the things that are in the way until we actually have a good eye on what those things are. So we know that for a lot of community-based domestic violence and sexual assault programs, there are tight, parallel relationships with police departments and prosecutors' offices, and that makes a lot of sense, you know, how that happened. You know, in many ways, you know, community-based advocates and systems-based advocates work together in order to try to put together a system where survivors were getting justice and people who abused their partners were being held accountable. And so those relationships are in place. The players know each other a lot. And working on the quote unquote other side of the courtroom might be seen as something that damages those relationships. Um, there's also a fear of being biased. And you know, I think this is a legitimate fear. You know, for advocates who are, are going to court and, and providing legal advocacy and support to survivors whose batterers are being charged with crime, you know, suddenly they're also showing up for a handful of defendants, most of whom are probably women. You know, that, there's definitely a real fear there that, that the, the advocate is, is choosing services based on gender and not based on somebody's experiences of abuse. So, I mean, I think that's a fear. I think that's a fear that can be overcome, but it's definitely something that can get in the way for some programs. Um, we've heard a lot about people who say they can't work with victims because of the funding restrictions that they have. Um, and this, you know, this was a, pro a, a bit of a problem, at least, for a lot of programs under the old um, VOCA regulations. And, uh, and so many of those barriers have been eliminated, and they've been eliminated in a really deliberate way. Um, so th that barrier is, is gone for, for a lot of people who rely on VOCA funding. But the problem is not everybody necessarily knows about those changes in regulations. So, whether it's from VOCA or any other source of money, there's, there's two things to do. One is to um, actually know what the parameters are of, of that funding and make sure that it's not you know, a perception rather than, than, a, than a real restriction. Um, and then you know, the other thing to do, I said we weren't going to talk a lot about solutions today, but we'll talk a little. The other thing we can do is figure out ways to use restricted funding for certain activities and other funding for working with defendants. So there's ways that people can be creative to get around that particular barrier. But I, before doing any of that, would want to make sure that that was actually a real barrier. Because I think people find, you know, once they really look at restrictions, that there's a lot more they can do with defendants than maybe, than maybe they think. Um, and then barriers you know, can be a little bit more invisible, at least until we say them out loud, but definitely this idea that once somebody is arrested, they are the perpetrator. Um, and that's, you know, that's a myth that gets perpetuated for a lot of reasons. Um, and I'm not just talking about cases in which, you know, the, the police got it wrong or got the wrong person or what have you, I'm, that does happen sometimes. But there's also cases in which people get arrested and you can absolutely see the reason that they got arrested. Maybe there's no legal defense for whatever they did or didn't do. However, um, that doesn't mean that they are a perpetrator of ongoing battery against their abusive partner. Um, so so when, when programs let criminal legal system frameworks decide who gets services and who doesn't, that can be a barrier to working with charged victims. Now, 
victims who are in need of services, you know, are kind of looking at these barriers from the other side. But I want to be ex explicit about some of them because um, I don't necessarily know that they're always so obvious. I mean, when, when programs are conducting criminal record and warrant checks, you know, that's not only a real, it, that's not only a barrier, that's also a deterrent. You know, people might not seek services at all from a program if they think that their information is going to be scrutinized in that way or, or that they're going to place themselves in danger of being put on the radar or being arrested. Um, court culture that defendants face can be a huge barrier, and I'm going to talk about that in a little more detail in a minute, so just hold on to that one. The, the fact that the defense attorney community and community-based advocate community aren't necessarily <laughs> connected in some places, or if they are, it's not in a good, productive, fruitful way, that can be a barrier to victims. You know, They may be connected to their defense attorneys, they may be connected to their advocates, but if, those, if the advocates and defense attorneys aren't talking, there's going to be a gap there. Okay? Um, system recognition we've already talked about, and we've also talked about how you know, victim defendants are among the people who are most in need of support and services. So by court culture, um, what I mean by that is really the messages that victim defendants and everyone else are getting once they go into court and the messaging in particular I'm talking about are, you know, centered around who is entitled to what kind of support and services. Um, this is, even, even if the reality in any given community is that a defendant can access the same services as somebody who's not a defendant, it might not look that way. And there might be a lot of reasons that, that um, victim defendants don't believe that. I know that when I was a public defender, um, there was a couple of different courtrooms that were focused on domestic violence cases. Um, and I worked in those courtrooms quite a bit. And so you walk in, and there were, there were advocates in the courtroom. And the advocate was sitting next to the prosecutor at the prosecution's table. The advocate was answering the phone when witnesses would call in. The advocate was helping people um, check in to the courtroom. The advocate was coordinating with the prosecutor about you know, who was going to testify first or who needed to be sequestered. Um, and the advocate was also handing out subpoenas <laughs> to, um, to prosecution witnesses you know, before they left court for the day. And so I compl you know, a defense attorney who should probably have a little bit more information about the system she's in than her clients do, completely thought that those advocates were a resource for complaining witnesses only and not for those of my clients who were victims of intimate partner violence. I had no idea that I, my clients could have gotten support, services, advocacy, safety planning, housing resources sometimes from these people who were in court with me every single day. I didn't know because the message was being sent that they were another arm of the prosecutor. So paying attention to perception, I think, is, is particularly important if, if we want to make sure that defendants have equal access to our services. Um, I said we were going to talk more about getting over barriers next time, and, and we are. But just really quickly, let, you know, when we go back to our mission statements, do they say anything about prioritizing some survivors over others? Are we fulfilling our mission, um, you know, in ways that make our services available to all defendants, regardless of status as defendants? Um, are we making sure that we're serving people and not the criminal legal system? Are we making sure that we know the realities about what we can and can't do and we aren't basing our decision making on assumptions about what we can and can't do? Um, and are we partnering with the people that we need to partner with to ensure that we're giving the best services possible? And in this context, I'm talking about defense counsel. <laughs> 
So I would suggest that taking a look at and dismantling problematic court culture can be a huge step to making sure that defendants can get to our programs and our services. But I also would want, would, would encourage and invite people to be explicit about being open to giving services to defendants. Um, and the reason I think this one is so important is because, you know, defendants get the same messages that everybody else does. So we hear from, you know, victims all the time who tell us, oh, I'm the perpetrator now because I'm the one who got arrested. So this messaging isn't just harmful to people working with victim defendants, but it's, this messaging is harmful to the victim defendants themselves. They may stop seeing them, you know, they may start seeing themselves as, a perpetrator, um, even though, even though they're the victim of ongoing battering. Placing information and resources in our jails and prisons and reentry programs is a definite way to eliminate barriers to access of services for defendants. And finally, making sure that our advocacy that we are doing um, is comes from a defense perspective is crucial, and that is going to be the meat of what we're talking about on July 11th, making sure that our services are not only helpful for people who are defendants, but do no harm to people who are defendants. Um, if you're working with a defendant, we definitely would love to hear from you, and we will do what we can to support you. Um, if you're looking to start doing this work, same thing. We would love to hear from you. We would love you to give us a call. Um, but as a starting point, we would suggest that you check out a really comprehensive resource on our website that was written uh, by our director, Suostov, who you heard from, and a consultant of ours, Jane Sadusky. And it's a toolkit. I think it's like 147 pages. It's a toolkit for system, systems advocacy for victims of battering who have been charged with crime. There's lots of information in this toolkit about meeting the needs of victim defendants. So we want to work with you, but definitely check that resource out. There's others on the website, too, and there's some that aren't on the website. So we definitely want to hear from you and work with you. And I think this is a good time to stop and see what the questions are. Thank you, Cindine. Let's see. There's quite a few questions. Um, I'm going to actually print this out so then I can actually write on the list. So, um, And thank you all who made your comments. And that was really helpful. And we'll share those back with Cindine. She'll definitely have an opportunity to, to see the comments that you put in. Um, but before we get to the questions, I just want to clarify something, just if that wasn't clear from the beginning, that the posting of the recording of this webinar and the other webinars in this series, as well as the webinars that we have conducted in the past, is on, will be on the National Clearinghouses website, not BWJP's. And so we'll post that on the National Clearinghouses uh, website in about seven to ten days. Okay, so these are in no particular order, Cindy, so I'm just going to okay. go down the list that I okay. uh, collected here. Um, one of the questions was, abusers often claim victimhood themselves, as you talked about, and see any victim attempts at self-defense as victims abusing them. How can we do systems advocacy for victim defendants while warding off abusers' inevitable co-opting of these concepts for their own defense? Um, I, that's a really good question, um, and I don't... Um, yeah, I, I don't think we we really I don't know that there's secrets that that we have that if they fall into the hands of abusers are going to be anything new or anything that does further harm. Like as as the person who asked the question said, we know that abusers already do this. Um, we know that abusers seek out services simply to prevent the people that they're battering from getting services themselves. So I'm not so worried about you know giving away strategies that could end up helping abusers and hurting survivors. I think, you know, what's out there is already out there. I, I think what ends up happening is that um, when, <laughs> when abusers tell their attorneys that they're acting in self-defense, for example, 
there ends up not being the same kind of wealth of evidence to support it as victims have because it's simply not there. Now, is that always true? No, but these are not strategies that are, you know, kept under lock and key by the advocacy communities. These are strategies that are out there in the world to defend self-defense cases. So I, I, I don't think that making sure that victims have access to um, services and information about legal strategy is going to be something that ends up being of great benefit to abusers. Sue, do you have any more? No, I think you're right. I agree with that, so thank you. Uh, when you were talking about duress, one of the questions yes. that came up is, would prostitution be an example of being under duress, where the victim is forced to have sex with other men, but the boyfriend beats her for having sex with other men? I think, I mean, uh, prostitution is a great example of, um, you know, somebody who engages in behavior that's been criminalized um, under duress. But again, it's, you know, when they're trafficked, especially not when somebody's a sex worker of their own accord. However, that's going to be one of those situations like I was talking about where it's going to be really hard for the criminal legal system to view duress as a complete defense because, you know, of perceived opportunities to escape the abuse, to call the police and say, oh, somebody's forcing me to, um, to do sex work. It's, it, it's, it's really hard for people um, to, to show that they didn't have any other viable options. And that's what you have to do for a successful duress defense. You have to show that there was nothing else you could do besides the criminalized uh, behavior. And because the, the, the power that abusers actually have over their victims isn't understood from the outside looking in, people, you know, jur judges and juries are often going to decide that, uh, you know, process that, you know, duress is not available for somebody who allegedly could have walked away, called the cops, whatever the case may be. I don't know if that answers the question. I, I think so, so thank you. Um, this one's a hard one. What is the appropriate answer when a victim asks if they can take their children with them when there is no court order so that they are not charged with parental kidnapping or custodial interference? And somebody, uh, another participant weighed in and said, oh, it probably depends on your state laws regarding custody. What would you say? I mean, I, I, think, I think calling a family lawyer is always a really important step to f to find out, you know, what the laws are in that particular jurisdiction around who's allowed to have access to a kid and to what extent when there's no custody order. But, you know, calling a criminal defense attorney probably wouldn't hurt either. I think the answer that it de depends is really frustrating for a lot of people, but it's just really true. And it's not, like I was talking about, it's not just dependent on state law, it's dependent on the communities where people are from about how a court is going to respond if somebody just takes their children. So talking to local experts, particularly civil and defense attorneys, is, would, be, would be my recommendation. Thank you. Let's see, this is always the hard part when there's questions coming in when I'm asking questions, but I'll do the best <laughs> I can here. Uh, so Rebecca just asked another question, but one of the ones she asked earlier was, how does one go about helping a past victim get their rights restored and or a record cleared due to crimes that they had been found guilty of a decade down the road, felony charges? That sounds like a, she has a specific person in mind. <laughs> it sounds like she might. <laughs> oh, um, so I think the first step would be to understand what the options are in, in a particular jurisdiction, the, the process, there's a, there's a couple different options, but they're very, very limited for a lot of people. Um, there's an expungement process that people can go through in many states for many different charges. Um, sometimes felonies aren't among the charges that can be expunged. But what that means is that you apply to the court to have something taken off your record. Um, and advocates can really 
help victims understand things like paperwork that needs to be filled out, time limits that need to be adhered to, um, you know, what the court wants to hear in order to grant an expungement, and what kind of charges are not allowed to be expunged in a particular jurisdiction. If expungement isn't an option in the jurisdiction um, for the charge that she's talking about, you know, there's, it can be a long shot in a lot of places, but people can also apply for a pardon. Um, and again, that's a state-specific, jurisdiction-specific process, but a pardon is where um, you know, a governor or a board of people appointed by the governor decides that somebody um, should have something taken off of their record. So those are generally the two routes, and they're not easy routes, but for some survivors that can make an incredible difference um, in, in their lives. And Rebecca, if you are talking about a specific person, uh, you could call us. We're, we're not the national experts in this area, but we maybe can help connect you to somebody who might be able to help the specific person if that is really what the ask is about. Yeah. Um, and then Rebecca, you also talked about this idea about creating a judicial education packet. Um, if you want to write offline after this is over and say a little bit more about what you're thinking about, we could certainly engage with you about that. Uh, another question, Cindy, do you have sample written agency guidelines for working with battered women as defendants? Sample written agency guidelines. Um, well, I, isn't there something like that in the toolkit? I think it's really more in the expert witness piece. That's interesting. Oh, yeah. Um, I, I think we don't. I, and I, yeah. um, Cherie, if that's how, I'm sorry if I'm saying your name wrong, I'd love to hear what would be helpful to you. I mean, our guidelines are you should do it. Yeah. <laughs> and that yeah. may not be exactly what you're looking for. We do understand that. So maybe we can have a conversation offline about that, or you can give us a call, because we, we would love to hear what would be helpful to you. Uh, then it, there was a, a lot of discussion, actually, about arrest laws, and as I think you uh, people, if you were reading the chat, I did really encourage people to go and look at the resources on the Better Women's Justice Project uh, website. Uh -huh. um, I also, there was a shout out for a FAQ on relocation for okay. victim advocates uh, from the National Council of Juvenile and Family Court Judges. So thank you for uh, that, Helena, that's really helpful. Yes. Um, and I, I'm just looking at the time, and we've got a, just a couple minutes left. And Cindy, do you have some additional comments that you want to add now? I, I, let's see. There's lots of things happening here on the <laughs> on the chat. So, and, and I actually got disconnected, so so I can't even see the chat right now. Oh, um, you did. I did. I just got kicked off just now. Oh, you just did. Yeah. I was going to say, wow, you, you calm as a cucumber. <laughs> throughout the presentation. It's a little challenging when you get kicked off. So, yeah. um, One of the questions that did come up that maybe quickly you can address, it was uh, asking about whether or not you, we had any information about the rate about DV victims being charged with non-DV crimes like drug cases, DUIs, economic crimes. Uh -huh. um, that are more indirectly or possibly more indirectly connected. And I did uh, write back that it's very difficult to get information, accurate information about rates um, or sh numbers of domestic violence victims who are arrested for crimes generally. I mean, a big part of it is because it's so difficult to identify, like who gets to identify who's a victim. Exactly. And as Cindy said repeatedly throughout her a webinar is that so many of those victim experiences disappear once they become defendants. So, um, so I just wanted to address that a little further. Dot encouraged me to say something about that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, so thank you all for participating. And Sandine, any closing words? Well, I, I know that it can get frustrating to participate in something like this, um, ending the conversation.
about talking about all the reasons why this good work isn't getting done. So I really hope that each and every person on this webinar now is with us on July 11th so we can talk about the things we can do to work on behalf of um, charged victims. Thank you. Thank you. And also just, you know, the information's up there. Cindy can't see, I won't see it, but <laughs> other people can see it, hopefully, about the next two webinars that we're doing. And we're not requiring that you participate. I mean, you guys are all on this one, but please let your colleagues know, your coworkers, other people in your community know. They can jump on part two, even if they have not seen part one. It's okay. Um, you know, like I said, we are going to post the webinar. It would be great if they had an opportunity to come back and listen to this one. But really, it's okay for them to jump on uh, because really we think the more people are thinking about and talking about these issues, the better. Absolutely. Thank you, Sue. Okay. Great job, Cindy. Thank you. Thank you, Bye -bye. Carrie. Thank you, Dot. Thank you, Christy. And thank, thank you to all the present, um, people who participated. Um, some of you very fully in the chat box. <laughs> Have a good afternoon, everybody. Thank you. Bye. Conference will automatically end in 60 seconds.